I ran across a quote this week. I want to share it with you. And the quote goes like this. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. You ever heard that before? All right. Uh, this is from Stephen Covey, who is a businessman educator. He wrote a popular book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Let me repeat it again. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. All right. Do you get what he's saying? That's kind of a weird way to say that. He's saying whatever is most important should be most important, right? Keep the main thing. No, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And as we think about that, I wonder, and maybe you can ask yourself this morning, what would be your main thing? What is the, the most important thing for you? You know, if we were to ask the Apostle Paul this question, I bet he would tell us about one main thing that, that permeated his life, that permeated his work and his message. It's the same main thing that we have seen again and again and again in the book of Acts. It's the same main thing that really leaps off every page of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. That main thing is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when I say gospel, many of you think of a lot of different things. You think of a style of music maybe. Or maybe when I say gospel, you think of just a fancy religious word. But we're going to discover today, through the life of Paul, through what he experienced, what the gospel does, what the gospel is, and who the gospel is for. And along the way, I think we'll see that really it is the main thing. So to recap before we begin Acts 26, uh, we have been what feels like an extended multi-chapter episode of Law and Order Ancient Rome, right? Uh, Paul has been on trial, and he's been bouncing around different courtrooms in the ancient Near East. And uh, last time we were together, last week, in Acts 24, uh, we saw Paul appear before a governor named Felix. Uh, Felix sent him to sit in jail for two whole years. Well, eventually Felix uh, gets fired, and a new governor comes in named Festus. And in Acts 25 which we're not going to have time to read all today during this uh, during our section, but I hope you'll read it at home, okay? If you're watching some football games later, read it during a couple commercial breaks. It'll be done in 10 minutes. Uh, Acts 25, in Acts 25, uh, a new governor, Festus, brings him to trial. Festus wants to send Paul back to Jerusalem. Paul does not like that idea because people want to kill him in Jerusalem. And so Paul, as a Roman citizen, pulls out his Roman citizen trump card, and he says... I appeal to Caesar. And when he says that, I appeal to Caesar, he sets in motion a series of events where he will go to Rome and have a trial before Caesar. But before he goes, in the second half of Acts 25, uh, the Jewish king Agrippa II and his sister, Bernice, come to Caesarea. King Agrippa, his sister Bernice, they come with pop. They come with circumstances. They come with all manner of formalities. And the prisoner, Paul, has a chance to tell them about the main thing. So let's pick up Acts 26, verse 1. So Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. Verse 2, I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I am going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time that they are willing to testify that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. 
And for this hope I am accused by Jews of him. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. We begin this section, we're going to see from Paul, the gospel is the main thing because of what the gospel does. And as we saw, Agrippa invites Paul to defend himself. And Paul chooses to begin his defense by pointing to his past. He explains how he was an abundantly religious person. Right? He says, basically, he was a strict rule-keeping Pharisee. He was abundantly religious. He was also abundantly passionate. He passionately opposed those he thought were wrong. He voted to have them sentenced to death. And in a raging fury, he says, he went off to far cities to persecute them. Which this should be a reminder to all of us. It is possible to be religious, to be passionate, and yet still be religiously and passionately wrong. So this was Paul's life. He was religious, he was passionate, but something dramatic happened to change his entire life course. Verse 12. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. So Paul was on his way to carry out another persecution, but Paul saw a light. Now, what is the brightest light that you can think of? The sun, all right? It's so bright that if you look at it, all right, you're going to scorch your eye, your retinas or whatever, you know. It's, it's incredibly bright. And Paul says as he's walking down the road, something brighter than the sun shines on him. And he falls to the ground, and he hears a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus Christ himself dramatically intervened in Paul's life. See, before this moment, Paul could physically see, couldn't he? But he was spiritually blind. But in this moment, God physically blinded him, but spiritually he could see for the very first time because Jesus had saved Paul's soul. And after that, Jesus had explained to Paul what this would mean for the rest of his life. Verse 16. Jesus says to Paul, But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Jesus is giving Paul a purpose. Jesus is telling Paul he would be a servant and a witness to all that he'd seen. He would go to his fellow Jews. He would go to the non-Jews. He would point them all to the one who opens blind spiritual eyes. 
that they too can turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so they can have forgiveness, so they can have a place in this community of God. Jesus is giving Paul a purpose, and by implication, Jesus is giving Paul a family. The same community of God he's going to tell other people about would be his own spiritual community. And Paul would give his life, literally, to serving the church and to starting churches all around the world. Okay, So this is what Paul is beginning his defense to Agrippa. He points to his past. And to boil everything that Paul had just said down to its simplest form, Paul is telling us, telling them from his own life story, the gospel saves us from our sin and past. The gospel saves us into a community, the church. The gospel saves us for a purpose, the mission of God. This is what the gospel does. In the gospel, Jesus redeems us from our past and our sins and our failures. He doesn't leave us there. He doesn't leave us on the street. He brings us into a community, a, a community of redeemed people called the church. He doesn't leave us there. He gives us a purpose. We are saved into a purpose for the mission to tell other people about him. We are saved through the gospel from, to, and for. Now, when I think about this, I think about my first real job. Okay, How many of you all remember your first real job? All right. Only half of you. So I don't know what that means about the other half of you. But anyway, I remember my first real job. You all probably know her, heard me talk about it. My first real job was to work at Chick-fil-A, and it was my pleasure to serve all of you, right? Um, before then, I had no job. I was unemployed, right? They hired me from my unemployment. Now, when I was hired by Chick-fil-A in, uh, in Athens, Atlanta Highway in Athens, uh, when I was hired, could I just then stay at home in my PJs? You tell me. No, right? When I was hired, I was hired into a group of employees, and I had to show up. I had to be there alongside other folks who were hired by Chick-fil-A at Atlanta Highway in Athens, Georgia. Now, when I was hired and I was brought into this community of fellow employees, did we sit around the back of a restaurant and twiddle our thumbs? No, right? What did we do? We, we were hired for a purpose to sell some chicken, right? Chicken sandwiches, chicken nuggets, chicken burritos, chicken salad, chicken, whatever, we sold the chicken, right? Uh, my boss put us to work to, to do the thing for which we were all striving. You think about that, and, and it's kind of a silly comparison, but the gospel kind of does the same thing. We are saved from, not unemployment, but from our sins. We're saved into a community of people. We are saved for a purpose which is not just selling chicken, right? We're, we're saved for a purpose of telling others about it. Now, but thinking about that, though, I think, honestly, a lot of us treat the gospel in ways that we would never, ever treat our jobs. I mean, imagine, again, thinking about this in comparison, imagine you were living on the street. You were living on the street. You had no job. You were homeless. But someone comes down, sees you there, digging through a trash can and says, you know what? I want to hire you. And they hire you for a job. It pays well. It has benefits. has an excellent 401k. And plus, the new boss goes ahead and gives you a new set of clothes. He sets you up in an apartment. He gives you a company car. You are all set. But a day or two into the job, you say, nah, that's not for me. And you leave all that to go back to digging in the trash. Is that smart? No. It sounds ridiculous when we think about it in terms of our job, but isn't that what we so often do with the gospel? God saves us from our sins. But we want to walk back over to the trash can. We want to dig around for scraps of food, for things that we think will make us happy, but they're not. Listen, in the gospel, Jesus has saved us from that life. You don't have to go back, right? 
Or imagine the same boss hires you for this amazing job, okay? And you do accept it. You get the apartment, the company car, and, and, and he gives you in, uh, in the office there a nice desk. You've got a phone over here, a computer to do your work. You've got uh, some legal pads to do things and a, and a chair, a comfortable chair. And he gives you this spot in the office. And he says, all right, next Monday, 10 a.m., we've got a meeting with all the uh, fellow coworkers, and we're going to plan out some of the, this quarter's big projects. Okay? But you say, you know what? I'm fine. I don't think I want to come into work today. Uh, you know what? In fact, I really don't think meetings are for me. Um, maybe I'll come in a couple times a year when we have office potlucks. But really, I can do just fine on my own. I don't, I don't, and honestly, I don't like some of the folks there. They kind of annoy me. So I'm just not going to go into work. Now, what, is that a good idea? No. Would you do that at your job? All right. Well, so often we do that with the gospel, don't we? God saves us into a community. We're like, nah, I'm, I'm good. I'll come in for the potlucks. I'm fine, though. I, I, I don't need to come in. Listen. The idea of a churchless Christian is foreign to this book. When God saves you, he saves you into a, a not family, not just a co-worker, but it's a family. The family of God. He saves you into the church. Or just continuing this analogy a little bit further. Imagine the same boss says, all right, you come into work. Thank you. Now I have some assignments for you to do. They're really important. Uh, this is the business of our company, I am trusting you with these assignments. But then you say, I don't, I don't think that's for me. Listen, I'm not very good at that. And, and besides, I don't want to be pushy and ask folks to do stuff. I'm just not going to do the work that you have given me. Would you do that at work? One time. <laughs> Never again, though, right? Um, it, this is ridiculous, right? But that is often what we do with the gospel. Uh, God has given us a purpose. And, and again, the idea of a, of a Christian who doesn't do what God calls him to do is not in the Bible. Jesus has saved you for a special divine purpose to, to join in what he is already doing in this church and in the world. Now, many of us wouldn't dare to do these things in our jobs, or you would not have dared to do them when you did work. But the reality is one day your job is going to end. You either will retire, you will move on, or they'll kick you to the curb. Hopefully not that, but, but that's the reality. What you do with your job matters. But it'll matter for a few years. What you do with this matters not just for a few years. It matters for literally all eternity. So ask yourself this, and this is something we could all ask ourselves. In what ways do you and I treat our job or treat whatever, any other part of our life? Do we treat that better than we treat the beautiful good news of the gospel? Because the gospel is the main thing because of what it does. It saves us from our sins into the church for the mission of God. The gospel is the main thing for what it does. The gospel is also the main thing for what it is. Look at verse 19 with me. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God performing deeds and keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Paul continues his defense with before King Agrippa. He talks about how when God gave him a purpose, he obeyed that purpose in his life by telling others about Jesus. 
And, and we talked earlier about what the gospel does. Paul tells us here what the gospel really is. He tells us the contents of the gospel message. And, and he tells us this in the middle of the section. He says it is to repent. What does it mean to repent? Right, turn. Turn away from one thing. He says repent. And he says and turn to God. And then he says performing deeds in keeping with the repentance. And the idea here is not that we are saved by our good deeds, but that we are saved for good deeds, right? And Paul admits here that a lot of folks did not like his message, but he's telling Agrippa, I preached what I see in the Old Testament, that the Christ, the Messiah would suffer, that the Christ, the Messiah would then rise from the dead, that the Christ, the Messiah would proclaim light, hope, truth. Freedom will proclaim light to everyone. And this, to me, is a, is a simple, crystal clear version of what the gospel is. If you were to ask, what is the gospel? The gospel, Paul says, is the message that Jesus Christ came to earth as God in the flesh. That Jesus Christ, as God in the flesh, allowed himself to suffer. He allowed himself to die. And then he rose again on the third day so that if we repent, right, that word, turn from our past and sins and turn to Jesus, we can be saved. We can be spared the judgment, the wrath of God. And, and when I think about this, there's a story that comes to mind actually from just this week. Uh, earlier this week, uh, down in our home area in Georgia, uh, there was some, some really, really bad storms. How many of y'all remember the thunder and lightning here a couple of nights ago? All right. It was like that, but a whole lot worse down there. Um, and, and during the storm, one, one news article we found, uh, it was after the storm, there was one dark, foggy morning. The rain was pouring down, and a lady was, I guess, driving to work, driving her red Jeep Cherokee um, down a road, a road called Rocker Road in Wilkes County, Georgia. And as she's driving down Rocker Road in Wilkes County, Georgia, the road collapsed. Her car fell 30 feet into the water. And she crawled out of her car. She climbed up, tried to climb up out of the hole. She was soaking wet, disoriented. Um, she couldn't see because of the fog and the rain and the darkness. But 300 feet away, true story. This is the length of a football field. 300 feet away, she saw a large cross. And there was some decoration in someone's yard or church. She saw the large cross, and she instinctively walked towards the cross. And as she approached the cross and got closer, there was a guy who had come out to warn other folks about what was happening in the road, and he saw her. And he ran to her and and helped her, and, and, and they called someone for help. And the reporter interviewed this man, and he said, God works in mysterious ways. He said he saved her that morning. He really did, right? She was lost and in darkness. The cross rescued her. Okay. This is just a real-life picture, honestly, of what the gospel is. You and I were both lost and in darkness. But the cross rescues us. When we turn from the darkness, we turn from our sin, and we believe in Jesus. This is what the gospel is. Sadly, though, a lot of false gospels weasel their way into the church. Weasel their way into our lives. And these false gospels are very prevalent. You've probably heard someone say it or you maybe yourself believed it. One of them is the gospel of good works. The idea if I do more good than bad, then God will save me. I'll go to heaven. One of them is the gospel of church membership. If my name is on a roll somewhere in some church somewhere, then I'm, God's good with me and I'll get into heaven. Another false gospel is the gospel of grading on a curve. The idea that God grades on a curve, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm on the good side of it. Uh, right? No one ever thinks they're on the bad side of the curve, but, uh, but God's going to grade on a curve, and I'll be fine. 
Or maybe it's the gospel of politics. The idea if I vote a certain way, then God will be pleased with me and I'll get into heaven. Or maybe it's the gospel of helping others. If, if I volunteer, if I help the poor, if I make the world a better place, then I'm, I will gain entrance into heaven. Maybe it's the gospel of Jesus plus anything else. The idea if I trust in Jesus and dot, 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 whatever that may be, then that's what gets me into heaven. Listen, none of these are the gospel of Jesus Christ. None of those will save your soul. All of those will send you to hell. Because all of those boil down to one thing. I can save myself. The gospel says you can't save yourself. The gospel says you can't save yourself. The only solution was for God to send His Son to take your place. Right? The only solution, your only hope is that big bright cross in the darkness. So before we move on, just ask yourself, what gospel are you believing? What gospel are you believing? Are you believing a gospel that says it depends on me to be saved? Are you believing the true gospel which says it's all Jesus? Because repentance and faith, believing in Jesus, this is what the gospel is, and that is why it is the main thing. Third, the gospel is the main thing because of um, what it does, what it is, and third, who it is for. Look at verse 24. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus, the governor, said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. So Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. I'm speaking true and rational words. Right? Festus just interrupts and says, Paul, you are cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Right? What you're talking about makes no sense. The idea of a resurrection is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. You should just be quiet. You're embarrassing me in front of the king. That's basically what he's saying. And Paul says, no, 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 I'm not crazy. And then Paul says, Let, let's talk to Agrippa, verse 26. For the king knows about these things. I'm sure Festus is like, oh, great, here we go. This prisoner is going to be embarrassing me in front of the king. Paul says, the king knows about these things. And to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but to all who hear me on this day, might become such as I am, except for these chains. Paul turns to Agrippa, the king. And you can feel the fervor. You can feel the excitement in his voice. I can only imagine that as he is rotted in jail for two years, he has prayed and prayed that God would give him a chance like this to tell someone about Jesus. And here he is standing in front of the king, standing in front of all those who are watching. And Agrippa, he knows, as an ethnic Jew, knows the Old Testament. And Agrippa, he knows, has his family story interwoven with that of Jesus. Because you know what uh, Agrippa's first name was? Herod Agrippa II. You ever heard of Herod before? Agrippa's great-granddaddy, King Herod, was the same guy that sent the wise men to go rat out where Jesus was. Same guy who had all the babies, the male babies in Bethlehem killed because he didn't want Jesus. Alright? Herod Agrippa's great uncle was Herod Antipas. The same guy who went to John the Baptist. The same guy who Jesus stood before when he was on trial. Herod Agrippa's dad, Herod Agrippa I, 
had sentenced one of Jesus' apostles and best friends, James, to death. All right? Herod's family story was interwoven with the story of Jesus. But all these years later, his great-granddad's dead, his uncle's dead, his dad dead. He's standing there. Who is still alive, Jesus is claiming? Sorry, Paul is claiming. I just gave it away. Who's still alive? Paul's saying Jesus is still alive. He rose from the dead, and he is still the actual king. Paul is pressing into Agrippa, preaching the gospel directly to him, helping him be confronted with the idea that maybe he is not the ultimate king, that there is a king greater, and he needs to give his life to that king. And Agrippa is dumbfounded. I wonder if he never had anybody talk like this to him before. And Agrippa says, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? The idea here is that Agrippa realizes that this filthy prisoner with chains on his hands is trying to get him, the king, to convert. This crazy missionary wants him to believe in Jesus. Let's see what happens in verse 30. Then the king rose, and the governor, and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, This man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. And just like that, Paul's trial before Agrippa is over. And just like that, Paul is going to begin his journey to Rome, which we will see next week. But this little section, this little confrontation between Paul and Agrippa, to me, is a reminder about who the gospel is for. Namely, the gospel is for everyone. The gospel's for everyone. The gospel is for lowly, chained up prisoners in rags like Paul. And the gospel is also for lofty, well attired kings like Agrippa. The gospel is for those who have lived a life of religious fervor like Paul. The gospel is also for those who have lived a life of public sin and scandal like Agrippa. We won't get into things, but let's say he had some public sin and scandal in his life. The gospel is for everyone. And I imagine that as Paul spoke, Agrippa kept these ideas at arm's length. Maybe he told himself that this guy is just a little off his rocker. Maybe he, he told himself that, you know what, I just need to appease this nutcase and get on with my day. But Paul would not let him do it. Paul pressed the gospel into Agrippa's life, so Agrippa was forced to decide, will I believe this or not? This morning, will you believe this or not? So many of us are like Agrippa. We keep the gospel, we keep the church at arm's length. We think, you know, all this religious talk is for some people, but it's not for me. Yeah, the church is good for some people, but it's not for me. Yeah, many people are going through hard times. They need faith but I'm doing all right and I'm fine. Or maybe others, maybe you, maybe you come near the gospel, come near the church when you're suffering, when you need something, but as soon as the crisis is averted, fade away. But in all of these reactions, one thing is the same. You think, or people think, the gospel is for someone else, but the gospel is not for me. If you hear nothing else in this message today, hear this. The gospel is for you. Whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're 10 or 90, whether this is your first time in church or your thousandth time in church, whether you're red and yellow, black and white, you're precious in the sight, the gospel is for you. Not the person next to you, not just the person next to you, not the person you're thinking about, it's for you. Because you are a sinner. The Bible says that God will judge your sins in eternity in a place called hell. 
But God loved you to this degree that He sent His Son to die and rose again to spare you from that. So if you, as Paul said, repent and believe, you can be forgiven. The gospel is for you. And I don't know where you are in your life. I don't know what you think about this stuff or if you've ever given your life to Jesus. But if you have never in your life said, I want to repent of my sin and believe in Jesus, today is the day. Today's the day to do that. Maybe this is your way that just as Paul was pressing into Agrippa's life, Paul is pressing into your life so you will repent and believe. And if you have repented and believed, you do know people who have not. If you are a Christian, you know someone who is not a believer, and if you're honest with yourself, they're on a path to destruction. Will you love them enough to tell them the truth? Will you love them enough just to simply pray? The gospel is simple, but it's also complex. The gospel is foundational, but it's also beautiful. The gospel is the, the profound message that Jesus Christ saves sinners. He saves them from their sin. He saves them into the church. He saves them for the mission. And the gospel is a message that is for you and you. And you and you and you and you and you and you. Let's keep the main thing. The main thing. Let's pray. Father, help us to be gripped by the reality of hell and judgment. God, some of us in this room, this is where we're headed. And it's an uncomfortable truth, but it is the truth. God, if someone is they're going down this path that today that you would intervene in their life, cause them to repent of their sins and believe in Jesus and be saved the very first time. And God, for the rest of us, we know people. We love people who are headed down this path. God, give us a burden for them. Help us to pray for them. Help us in our own lives and in our relationship with these people to remember the, the main thing is the main thing, and the main thing is the gospel. God, thank you for how you have saved us. Thank you for what you have done for us. Thank you that the gospel is for people just like us. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.